Hi there, and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. Uh, and tonight um, I'm looking again at the work of David Cote, um, particularly The Great Fear, um, his history of the anti communist purge under Truman and Eisenhower. Um, and the thing that I want to talk about tonight, so it's an interesting aspect of, of what is a kind of a, uh, a topic with many different strands to it. And that is the supposed um, culpability of the American Communist Party. At the time, in the, the late 1940s, early 1950s, it was widely believed or uh, alleged that the American Communist Party, um, with its connections to Comintern, was involved in subversion and in espionage. Now, the argument that David Cope puts forward, and we're going to look at this in a moment, is that, of course, there was espionage. Um, the Soviet Union, yes, of course, was spying on America. Um, and it would be naive to assume that that wasn't happening. But the... American Communist Party, there is no evidence whatsoever that the American Communist Party had any role in this. And anyone with any, even the sort of the, the, the smallest, um, most minuscule grasp of um, uh, intelligence history would probably concur that the, uh, the Soviet espionage didn't didn't work in this way. Um, the Soviet Union encouraged parties in uh, non-communist countries to take whatever this, the Stalinist line was, and they um, encouraged within the uh, Communist Party of America to ensure that uh, party members stuck to the party line, uh, and there were, you know, reprisals and all sorts of uh, kind of unpleasant activities carried out by party members against those that didn't, particularly those that were seen as kind of Trotskyite deviationists. But in terms of accessing state secrets, there is a very good reason why the Soviet Union didn't use uh, satellite, satellite communist parties, um, or parties uh, that were affiliated to Comintern, to, to do that. It's because they, were incredibly, they would have been incredibly easy to detect and to catch. The, um, the, the history of, of Soviet espionage is, um, and the function of Soviet espionage, the use of illegals uh, uh, and, um, you know, this, this kind of really quite, um, uh, quite out there, um, uh, you know, inter intelligent stuff of, things like like uh, essentially sleeper agents that were did actually exist that's the topic of a, of a different um a different podcast or different many many different podcasts tonight we want to look at how the uh the the fear of espionage was weaponized against american communism okay so we're going to dive into david coach now and I've just lost my page. <laughs> Here we go. So he writes, Spy fever flowed into the bloodstream of the nation from the twin needles of a single hypodermic, the Cold War and the backlash against the New Deal. Um, the Republicans in the late 1940s realised that they had no economic offer, no meaningful economic offer to make to the American people. The New Deal uh, and the massive state intervention years uh, of the war years had shown um, the American populace that laissez-faire capitalism um, was not something that they could rely on, and the the intervention of the state uh, and the intervention of a, a democratic led a democrat uh, led state was um, electorally a far better bet, and the Republicans weaponized anti-communism um, and the quest questions of national security to imply that, uh, as um, uh, McCarthy would later put it, that from 1932 um, to 1952 had been a period that he called uh, 20 years of treason, that they, somehow the, um, the United States had uh, attacked too far to the left and had become annoyed from its essentially right-wing individualistic roots. Um, but the, the New Deal 
was the thing that they were really seeking to, to destroy. The notion of the vital secret, the fantasy of the Habs, whose nuclear monopoly was threatened, um, hypnotised congressmen, newspaper editors and radio commentators. Despite the fact, familiar to all informed observers, that Washington is a vessel that leaks from the top, a cabinet discussion in 1945 about the merits of letting Russia share the secret of the A-bomb had been leaked within half an hour to a prominent journalist. The psychological imperative to equate radicalism with treason with an anarchic alienation from the cradles of loyalty soon brought about a most pathetic public gullibility to any tale of conspiracy. There is no documentation in the public record of a direct connection between the American Communist Party and espionage during the entire post-war period. Even during the Korean War, no evidence of communist sabotage or attempted sabotage came to light. The anti-Soviet, anti-communist historian Theodore Draper has written, It would help in understanding the communist movement if the terms conspirator and conspiracy were reserved for actual Soviet agents. Except for a tiny minority, the communist membership has devoted its efforts to gaining mass influence uh, with means that have been blatantly non-conspiratorial. So, the the use of language here was was significant. Um, as Draper said, the it, it would have been um, uh, entirely proper to refer to uh, actual Soviet agents as being involved in a conspiracy. But the way in which um, the Republican Party and many Democrats too, because they were there were plenty uh, of anti-communist Democrats. Uh, conservative commentators and liberal commentators as well. I, I did a podcast a while back on uh, the the kind of the democratic establishments uh, anti-communism. The way in which they talked about the Communist Party, um, this party uh, that had only barely a, a legal and constitutional right to exist. Um, as a kind of a conspirator against the United States of America. It presumes that there is a, a one version of the United States of America uh, that exists, a uh, kind of liberal capitalist version, um, and that that is the, the only legitimate one, and therefore any attempt to present an alternative set of beliefs and an alternative ideological picture it isn't simply just um, uh, a different um, a, a political challenge. It's not even political dissent. It is treason. Um, and that, again, points to sort of deeper ideological assumptions about who is being conspired against uh, and who, who uh, which group sees themselves as being in charge in uh, America. So David Coat writes, one thing, however, must be made clear here. Those who deplore the anti-communist purge tend to dismiss all allegations of espionage as fabrications of the FBI. This would imply either that the Soviet Union did not attempt to suborn or succeed in suborning Americans, or that, if it did, the FBI never caught the guilty, only the innocent. Such assumptions are silly. They are not shared by the present writer. It is therefore a very real question whether Alger Hiss, the Rosenbergs and others were in reality guilty or innocent of their crimes, uh, of which they were accused and convicted. But it is a question which it lives, lies outside the proper province of this book and this podcast. There's already an abundant and contentious literature on the subject. Hiss and the Rosenbergs make their appearance here as elements in our portrait um, of the foreground. The front stage dramatics, which inevitably heightened tension throughout the country and greatly exacerbated the purge. So th this is an important point, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. Of course, the Soviets were spying. Um, the, uh, the Los Alamos spy ring, um, the, the extent of the, the guilt of the Rosenbergs um, is, is up for debate. Many historians have questioned 
uh, how far either uh, Ethel or Julius Rosenberg really knew what they were doing, or if one was more guilty than the other. And again, this is this is um, uh, for a, a different kind of uh, of, of discussion. Um, uh, and even if they were guilty, um, the the brutality of their execution uh, stirred deep uh, deep worry and fear and anxiety and anger uh, in many parts of America, not simply just the the, the liberal establishment. That being so, um, the the way in which the case of the Rosenbergs and Alger Hiss uh, and uh, various others was weaponized and used wasn't designed necessarily to uh, prevent uh, espionage, uh, Soviet espionage in, in America. It was designed to score broad political points by um, the the Republicans and the the right uh, of the, uh, the the right leaning Democrats um, in, in order to uh, continue waging a cold war, which was in David Coates' view in America's interests to wage, and also to destroy the organised left in America, which um, particularly in, in the guise of the trade union movement had become greatly empowered during the uh, Depression years and the New Deal and the uh, the war years. Um, on the 15th of February 1946, the Canadian government announced the arrest of 22 people charged with illegally passing information to the representatives of the Soviet Union. This followed the defection from the Soviet embassy in Ottawa of a cipher clerk, Igor Gushenko. Um, who brought with him incriminating files that conclusively proved the existence of an espionage ring staffed by trained personnel from the NKVD and military intelligence. Washington also noted, noted proven links between the Canadian network and parallel ones in Britain and the United States, together with a demonstrable Soviet interest in devices relevant to post-war defence and communication systems of Western powers. Um, Closer to home, writes David Coates, the Amerasia case kicked off the post-war espionage hunting season. Early in 1945, agents of the Office of Strategic Services raided the magazine Amerasia uh, and turned up uh, uh, over 1,000 documents purloined from the State, War and Navy Departments. Those involved uh, included Philip Jaffe, the editor, Emmanuel Larson, a specialist in the China Division of the Bureau of Far Eastern Affairs, who was subsequently dismissed from the State Department, John Stewart Service, who was not, and Andrew Roth of Naval Intelligence. Although the Hearst and the Scripps Howard Press built the affair up into a great spy sensation, it was much less than that. At his trial in September 1945, Jaffe was described even by the prosecutor as a merely an overzealous editor. Larson turned up his coat and published a piece in September 1946, in the September 1946 issue of Plain Talk, a right-wing magazine, in which he complained that the State Department had been infiltrated by communists and accused Jaffe of having had dealings with Earl Browder, who was the head of the um, Communist Party of the USA, uh, and the Soviet consulate. This was no doubt true. Jaffe, a Russian-born businessman, had been active in the communist circle since the 30s and had visited Mao in Yan'an. Uh, you might recall uh, a podcast I did a while ago about uh, Edgar Snow, the uh, American journalist who first visited Mao in Yan'an in the 1930s and wrote the famous book uh, Red Star of China, um, uh, all the time uh, being uh, part of... Uh, being being kind of carefully managed by Mao's mind is the whole affair being uh, stage managed. Uh, but it made Yan'an a kind of um, uh, a focal point for um, the American and European left and um, liberal intelligentsia, the kind of the, the fellow traveller movement um, who went to uh, see this uh, kind of uh, revolutionary uh, figure who um, was, you know, made immensely famous by Snow's book. 
not realizing the extreme brutality that Mao uh, in uh, Yunnan uh, inflicted on his own supporters, purging those who he viewed to be um, potential potential rivals. Um, the uh, Maoism in, in uh, and a global history by Julie Lovell, of which I'm going to talk about a lot more on this podcast, is a great great book uh, and a great place to read about the Yunnan years. Um, so yes, he visited Yunnan and uh, wrote for um, Jaffe wrote for the magazine China Today under the name of J. W. Phillips, but neither he nor his sources. Um, had in mind to pass information to a foreign power. Each was committed to publicising the folly of American support for Chang. Um, nevertheless, the incident revealed how quick-fingered, politically committed government servants could be, particularly the talented, idealistic, opinionated, opinionated generation of young intellectuals who came to Washington under the New Deal. The uh, the question of China, uh, which after 1949 would become incredibly vexed, uh, was something that um, plagued uh, the uh, the Washington establishment. It was abundantly clear by 1946-47 that all was not well in China that um, the the nationalist movement uh, the, the the Kuomintang uh, was going to lose to Mao that Mao's um, aid from Stalin and the fact that um, the Chinese nationalists were so openly corrupt uh, and the fact that the Chinese nationalists were seemingly incapable of offering um, rural China any sort of meaningful program that would improve their lot meant that um, they they were fighting a losing battle. They could beat the communists on the battlefield. Though that was becoming more and more difficult um, as the communists were given um, uh, plenty of uh, leftover equipment from the Japanese that the uh, the Soviets had seized. The um, but they couldn't win a, a a battle for the shall we say the hearts and the minds of uh, millions and millions of Chinese people. Um, the um, Mao was even able to present himself as a far more patriotic figure, um, seeking to undo a century of humiliation at the hands of, of foreign powers, and was able to strongly imply that the nationalists were in hock to Americans and Europeans and everybody else who had dragged China um, and, and dragged China down. So when the um, the question of uh, uh, in 1949 arose as to who had lost China, um, the uh, American State Department, the U.S. State Department, came under heavy scrutiny from um, the Republicans, from the McCarthyites, um, who accused uh, spies in the State Department of having passed secrets to either the Soviet Union or the Chinese. Uh, much of this is complete fantasy. Um, uh, and in doing so, having created um, the loss of China. The idea, of course, cemented in certain minds in Washington that America had a China to lose, that China sort of belonged to America somehow. Well, America had a, a long-standing ambitions towards China, seeing it as a, a huge market for American goods and the, a possibly a kind of uh, a, a country which could be educated by America in the ways of achieving liberal democracy. So the the loss of China and the the graduate the, the gradual increase uh, of um, anxieties over uh, potentially losing China are, are something that are um, is is very much in 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 not necessarily in the public mind, uh, but in the minds of uh, those looking to uh, weaponize anti-communism during the period. Um, 
uh, General uh, George Marshall, then Secretary of, uh, Truman Secretary of State, went to China and concluded that the war was unlikely to be to be won. Um, and it, it was the the view of the likes of Marshall and a great many liberal uh, commentators that this was probably the case and it was better that America cut its losses. Now, the next time that I focus on this topic, um, I'm going to be talking about the former Soviet agent Whitaker Chambers. Um, but he's he's worthy of mention now because Chambers was the, the kind of the chief informant of the era. He is the person who um, is the, the kind of the, uh, the major uh, source of accusations against Alger Hiss. David Cope writes about him. Chambers, who described himself as a communist and a Soviet agent until early 1938, claimed that at least 75 government officials had been involved in varying degrees of pro-Soviet espionage in the late 1930s. Elizabeth Bentley who was a famous famous author of the, the book Out of Bondage. Uh, like Chambers, a graduate of Columbia, had joined the Communist Party in 1935 and, so she said, had been ordered to go underground three years later. Jacob Golos, um, head of World Tourists, a member of the Communist Party and reputedly an agent of the Soviet GPU, became her contact and lover until his death in 1943. She continued with her espionage work until um, August 1945, and she made, when she made contact with the FBI, uh, at whose request she maintained her contacts with the Communist Party underground until 1947, when she finally broke cover by testifying before a federal grand jury in New York. Um, on that time, the grand jury in, indicted 12 communist leaders under the anti-communist Smith Act and subpoenaed scores of past and present government employees um, accused of belonging to the Communist Party or to communist espionage rings. So uh, the uh, testimony of people like Bentley and Whitaker, um, who were the star witnesses for the FBI, had a huge, huge impact. Um, and the, the implication here uh, is that... Um, these in, these claims were highly unreliable, and largely uh, because much of the uh, assert, well, many of the assertions that the uh, Communist Party of the USA was actively involved in the type of espionage uh, that Whitaker Chambers and Elizabeth Bentley claimed was happening uh, couldn't have been true. There's no documentary evidence of it. And also it's just not how Soviet espionage worked. Um, Soviet um, spies, the most, well, the uh, KGB um, was the most, uh, had the most sophisticated spying apparatus in the world. And they just didn't rely on people in this way. Um, they were far more, uh, far more organised in their intelligence gathering than that. Okay, so let's finish there. Thanks very much for listening. Um, do check out the um, Explaining History website, explaininghistory.org, and go and find us at the Explaining History Facebook group. Uh, there's always something interesting going on there. Uh, and if you're able to um, help um, subsidise and fund and help the podcast in any way, uh, do find us on Patreon too, and you can find a link on the Explaining History website. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye-bye.